Good morning, Southgate. I love it. I love hearing the good mornings coming back. It tells me everybody's awake. Um, this scripture um, that we're going to look at in Numbers 23, I just, I want y'all to consider something. Because there's a lot of negative stuff and things and the sky is falling and everything else that's going on. We got war, all those kind of things. Please consider this. This was somebody that was trying to curse God's people. The, was being paid to curse God's people. And he went back three times and could only bless them. Nothing has changed except for that Jesus has come. And he said, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So listen to this word in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. If you watch the news, listen to this word first before you watch the news. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Amen. Worship him like you're a blessed people. Are you blessed? Amen. Show him. Sing it to him. Reflect, I find perspective there in the best and worst days of this life. You are always on my side. You're in the pain, you're in the promise, and on the days the furnace finds my faith. You're the fourth within the place. If he did it before, he can do it again. So I trust him with what comes next. Good God, I know he's known for faithfulness. Yeah, my heart says I can trust him with what comes next. For the God I know. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. 
You are a provider. You are a healer. You are a companion, Lord God. And we thank you. Good morning, Southgate Church. My name is Angie Refo. Um, aren't we just so glad that God's mercies are new every single morning? No matter what we did the day before, his mercies are new every single day. Um, I just want to read you this story. Um, it's by J. Wilbur Chapman. It's a really quick story. So a friend of mine in Cincinnati had preached his sermon and sank back in his chair. When he felt impelled to make another appeal, a boy at the back of the church lifted his hand. My friend left the pulpit and went down to him and said, tell me about yourself. The boy said, I live in New York. I am a prodigal. I have disgraced my father's name and broken my mother's heart. I ran away and told them I would never come back until I became a Christian or they brought me home dead. 
That night, there went from Cincinnati a letter telling his father and mother that their boy had turned to God. Seven days later, in a black-bordered envelope, a reply came, and it read, My dear boy, when I got the news that you had received Jesus Christ, the sky was overcast, your father was dead. Then the letter went on to tell how the father had prayed for his prodigal boy with his last breath and concluded, You are a Christian tonight because your old father would not let you go. So I just ask you guys, prayer is so vital in the church and in our lives. And as long as we keep praying, God will move. And it says in 1 Corinthians um, 15, 58, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So our prayer is a part of the work that we have to do. And God can always move and change people's hearts to come back. So no one is too far gone. So I just pray that you would just take this word and... Um, just keep on praying because we never know what God is going to do and where he's going to move. So just keep praying and he will bless you. Um, so just um, a little reminder is to make sure that you sign in. Um, we do have an app that you can download to your phones and sign in. So make sure that you do that. Um, also, make sure to fill out the prayer card and place it in the black boxes or you, in the back of the um, worship center, or you can also connect with us on the QR code. Um, a couple more announcements. We still need six more people to help us on our church workday, which is Saturday, June the 4th from 8.30 to 11. Lunch will be served following, and you can contact Paul Cimente. Wave, Paul. Woo! <laughs> so please sign up for that. That would be a big blessing. And then also for all the men in the church, um, the South Bend Cubs baseball outing um, will be on Tuesday, June 7th. And we booked two connecting suites for this game against Cedar Rapids. So take advantage of this, men. Get together. Um, the game starts at 7.05 and the gates open at 6 p.m. The cost is $30, which includes an all-you-can-eat buffet, a true ballpark classic of grilled beef burgers and hot dogs served with gourmet buns. Like, who wouldn't want that? Come on. <laughs> and all the trimmings and lemonade and Pepsi soft drinks. Um, you can sign up after church the next two Sundays with Paul and Bill in the foyer. Um, so who's going to sign up for that, men? Raise your hand. Come on. Yes. I see Rodney right there. Yes. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> um, and then so we just want to kind of tell you if you're new to kind of explain how kind of the service runs in the mor this morning. Um, so the, for the rest of the morning, Pastor Jeff, he'll share our morning message for approximately 30 minutes. Um, then we will worship again to, together and respond to the spirits leading in our lives. You can feel free during the worship time to come forward and get some undistracted time with God. You can come up and kneel down or... Um, praise the Lord however you wish, um, but we just ask that you do that. Um, and then we will pray a blessing over all of us, and then we conclude around 12 o'clock. So um, blessings to you all, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, Angie, for being willing to serve on Sunday morning. Hey, everybody, how are you? Good, me too. Thank you. Mm. Now, we did not have a ring earlier. So it just must be the presence, amen? It's all the bodies in the room, I think. Oh, yeah, I see, you know, I needed to, I needed to, it's Elevate Kids. It's, this, is our, this is our Kids Church theme shirt, and I was supposed to wear it three weeks ago, and I didn't, so as I was going through, I went, hey, I'm going to wear it today. It's got that slimming effect. So, yeah. Oh, and then I also want to thank uh, uh, someone in my congregation that likes to help me with my handicap. <gasps> did you not? Yes, I did. Come on. Thank you, Sarah Barthel. When that second piece of paper fell last week, she was already on... Uh, uh, a site purchasing me that stick. So. so, yeah. You're like, what's wrong with him? Is he too lazy to bend over? No. 
at the moment, I have a hip challenge, so you know how that is. To get all this awesomeness down and back is quite painful. So, but yeah, I want, oh, can I say a, a big thank you too to all of the people that are making it possible. We had a, we had a goal, a giving goal of $3,000 for our kids to go to camp. Um, we do some scholarshiping, subsidizing, things like that at our, here at Southgate Church for our kids to go to camp. It's pretty awesome. And so within the first week, guys, more than $2,000 has come in. Isn't that awesome? More than $2,000 is like, okay, we'll do that. Boom. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for being faithful in your giving and in your generosity. I'm just always, always blown away. Uh, it's not that I want to not expect it. I believe that God will provide, but you are just actually helping us and blessing our kids. And so it's going to be a, it's going to be some great weeks for our kids here at church. So just ask you to continue in your generosity. There's three ways you can give at Southgate Church. You can give online. You can text to give. Uh, you can also give by cash or check. So, and if you get home like, oh, I forgot to give, the mailman works for us too. He brings it every week. So, so we want to just encourage you to. To, uh, to be tithers, amen. Tithing is a biblical principle of stewardship. Uh, we're so grateful for that. Uh, if you have questions about that, I'd be happy to help you and show you in the scriptures how that works. Um, but the beautiful thing I learned early in my tithe habit is that, you know, he just, you cannot give God. He's always faithful. He is always faithful. Let me tell you a really quick story. I'm doing some premarital counseling for some dear friends of mine. Uh, that's there in Michigan. I've known this the, the bride since she was a little girl, and now she's a young woman. Oh man, so old. And so, she said, "Can you do our our wedding?" I said, well, "Yeah, I'd love to do your wedding." And so, her and her youth pastor husband, both he's a part time youth pastor at a church, and she is a uh, social worker and just got out of college. So you know, they're just getting going. They have their their price tags are still connected to them. They're that new in adulthood, and so. They're getting married and they wanted to buy a house. And how do you do that? Well, they found an abandoned house basically that was going up on an auction for $3,000. As long as you paid the $2,000 tax that went to it. So for $5,000, they'd have this house. Now that's just about all that they had scraped together. Now the good thing is he's handy and both dads are handy. So, you know, they're going to redo this house, right? So they went to the closing, you know, Thank God for it. These kids are tithers, you know, they're from the beginning. They're tithers, they're givers. And so the very next Monday, uh, when he opened up his, his mailbox at the place that he was living, there was a letter from somebody, didn't say who in the church, for a check for $5,000. You're like, does that happen every time? No, not every time, but it sure happens a lot. And it'll happen more if you give than if you don't. That I can promise. Amen? If, yeah, if, if I'm telling the truth, let everybody else in the room know about it, would you please? Because that's just the way God is. So just want to bless you in, in, in doing that. So <clears throat> can we? Huh? I know. I'll whisper. Who's this? Okay. Um, I can switch. Oh, okay. Just trying to be helpful. How many people have seen the movie, Jerry Lewis is in it, The Disorderly Orderly? Raise your hand. And remember what the nurse says to him? He says, I'm just trying to be helpful. Remember what she said? Don't try so hard. That's my life. Pray for my wife, would you please? So, Where are you at this morning, honey? Oh, there you are. I missed the scooter. There you are. Hey, baby. Give me the ring on the bell. That's my girl. Some angel just got their wings. Hallelujah. Just want you to know I fell down the stairs before church because I wanted to be like you. But I stuck the landing, so. Um, Y'all missed it. Come to church earlier on time and you would have seen some gymnastics today. Big gymnastics. Corey, quit laughing. I can see your face over there. So what I, better get going. So what I want to talk about today, sorry if you're visiting. Come back. Um. I'm going to talk about, I was, I've been praying about what to do these last two weeks because we're going into a preaching series starting in June with, with our preaching team here. I'm really, really pumped. I'll talk more about that. We'll put it out on our social media, give you the kind of the, the schedule for the summer. So June, July, and August, we're going to 
We're going to take a look at three topics, and they're really sweet. You know, passion is the first one. The second one is faith, and I don't remember because I didn't write it down what the third one is, but it's really good. You're going to like it. So, so we, and, and it's it, the overall theme of the summer is how it works, how it works. Um, we, we work within this kingdom system, the kingdom of God. It's a real kingdom, by the way. Uh, and within the kingdom of God, you have uh, principles and, and things that God has given to believers that he says, if you do this, then this is going to happen. Things work. Things happen, okay? And so the key is for us to seek the Lord uh, regularly and to ask him, God, what, you know, what do I do next? How do I do this? When we face challenges, when we face obstacles, we get stuck, we can come to him and say, you know, how can I get out of this? Like, here, here's a good example. Remember when Jesus was up on the mountain of transfiguration and he took three guys with him and they had a pretty miraculous moment? But down in the valley, there was a kid that was, that was possessed and needed deliverance. And so instead of living up on the mountain like Peter wanted to do, so many of us like to do that. Oh, let us live up here. This is so awesome, you know? And Jesus says, no, the work's in the valley. So he goes down the valley and here's this, here's this, this lad that needs some help. And so the disciples are down there were trying to help this kid, but they couldn't do it. Jesus walks in, the kid is delivered. And, and so at dinner that night, they ask, how does this work? Because we, we, these guys just got done on a two week mission trip where they, I mean, they, they were scattered in the countryside and people were delivered from evil spirits, and he, people were healed, and all kinds of miracles happened. And so in, they, they all come back together in this one concentrated time, and it didn't work. Ever Have you been there as a Christian? Why didn't that work? It worked all the time. It doesn't work now. Jesus, why didn't that work? And he said, the master said, that kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. So I wanted to do a summer series on how it works, because there are some really cool things that... Uh, Short illustration, uh, when I first came, there was someone come to the church who had been a believer for a while and just really loved, he's a man, just really love him. And, and um, <clears throat> we're all, I'm new in my relationship with him, he's new with me, and so I've been, but he'd served the Lord for a while, but after about like nine months, um, he had written me a letter and he said, you know, pastor, in all the time that I've been a believer, nobody ever told me how this worked. Because if, we are not a part of discipleship. If we are not part of dis discipleship is disciplined learning. If we're not continuing in discipleship, we, we never really learn how to grow. We never know what to do. We never know where the boundaries are. And so what happens is we just kind of wander around with this pocket full of faith like a hanky I have in my, when I need it, I'm going to pull this out. I promise you I will, okay? But, you know, it's, faith becomes that. We kind of hold on to that, and then we kind of live our life out here, and it's like it's not working. And so then we're like, well, can this work, you know? Christianity is in that way, okay? And so he says, now he says, I, I've discovered that there's actually boundaries. And he was really cool in his illustration. He says it was kind of like giving a kid a basketball, putting him out on the court, but you never tell him how to play the game. That can happen a lot within the kingdom. That can happen a lot within Christianity. Uh, where people will commit their life to Christ, but then they have to follow him. Discipleship is following him. So as we, as we learn and as we grow, there's just so many cool things about, about Jesus and about uh, spiritual things um, that I thought it would be good to launch that series on how it works. So we're going to talk about passion. That's our first one, beginning in June. So it gave me two weeks, and I, so I'm like, Lord, I, you know, I am... What can we say for two weeks that can be substantive, that can launch us in a direction that you would have for us? And this uh, concept came into my mind, and it's actually connected to one of the Beatitudes. So the title of the message this morning is Peacemaking in a Time of War. Part one. Part two will be next week. Peacemaking in a Time of War. Um. I wish, I wish I had a picture of my son's shoulder and bicep. He's stacked. And he's got a Spartan. Not the pollen. He's got a Spartan here with a sword. Across the bottom it says, blessed are the peacekeepers. As long as there's evil in this world, 
you're going to need peacekeepers and peacemakers. You need both. You, you, you can't have one without the other. Both need to be working together all the time. So he spends his time protecting the citizens of Ohio, and he's working on a federal task force now and so other places, but he spends his time protecting, just like all the peacekeepers we have here that we're thankful that when we go to bed at night and put our head on the pillow, they're up protecting it's who they are. And we have to have them. And the reason we have to, oh, it would be great to never, I mean, man, wouldn't it wouldn't be great to never need any of that. And that day is coming when Christ returns. And the fullness of God's kingdom is manifest in the earth physically. And he re recreates everything. The one thing that we will not have in this world is sin. But the reason why we have conflict and the reason why we have war and the reason why we have war within ourselves at times is because of the presence of sin. So as long as we have the sin, we have to have a remedy. And so the remedy is through two means that he has here. And you see it in the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. You see it in the New Testament. You have peacemakers and you have peacekeepers. And so I just want to give a shout out to anybody in this room that's a peacekeeper. God bless you. And all those who have served in our military, thank you very much uh, for your service. You, you function in a peacekeeping sort of way. But every Christian in this room is a peacemaker. Did you know that? Peacemaking is not what we do, it must become who we are to be a peacemaker. It's, so we're going to, man, we're going to dive deep in, in, into a couple places, and I have two lengthy texts that go together. They're 15 verses, so just go with me. But I wanted to give us the biblical foundation and this whole concept of peace. I have some friends in, uh, I, you know... I'm ambitious. If I meet you and we kind of like, you know, like we click, then you're my friend whether you like it or not. Sorry. So I have some really cool friends. They're like, I don't know him. Well, that's okay. You're my friend. <laughs> right? So fairness, they're probably acquaintances, but they're part of, they're part of an activist group here in the city that I know of. Um, um, I don't know if I can say I am in that group, but I do appreciate their work. One, one of the things that they do is when there is a loss of life due to violence in our city, they will go to the place where that person had perished and they'll pray. So I know these people, and they're just, I, just, I, love, I love their compassion. In fact, if you were going home last Sunday and you went down Chippewa, right there at, Mike, where do your parents live? On what street? You go to Kirk, what he said, Trail and Chippewa, right there at that T. There's all these people getting out. Where, did you guys see that? Well, there was a woman that died there. And so they will go to that place and they will seek God and they will pray for our city and pray for their family and, and thank God for the life of the person who had, who had lost theirs. Man, I just love them. So anyway, um, they're, real, they're real peacemakers and they're really, they're really big in my estimation uh, and uh, forward thinking in this whole concept of peace. Um, but what's important for us as Christians to know that there's all kinds of different definitions and kind of nuances to this concept of peace, and so I think it's important for us to know the biblical foundation for peace, okay? When, when, when we talk about peace and, and being a peacemaker and those kinds of things, what is it, what is that really? What is that, what is that really? I'm sure that in the room, uh, someone's communicated to you to do something, and you're sure you heard them right, and then in the midst of doing what they told you to do, it was not right at all. Have you ex ever experienced that? Only me? Okay, that's fine. Um, she, Becky said, can, I said, can I destroy all those weeds? And she goes, yeah, just kill them. Great. So I fire up my screen camera, and I'm just like, uh-oh, hey, uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. I killed, like, what were they? Irises. Yeah. She had 12. She now has three, okay? But I thought she told me, no, no, Okay. Well, we can't really afford to do that in our Christian life and how we live for Jesus, amen? We kind of want to be spot on on the mission, amen? You, you want a little, how many people want to live their life as a missional believer? You want to do what Jesus wants you to do. That's the mission, right? What's the success, the success in mission? It's radically fulfilling the will of God. That's what success in the kingdom is. It's not sizes, it's not numbers, it's not how many, it's not who, you know. Those, those are great measures that we can track, but real success in the life of, of a human believer is radically fulfilling the, the will of God, all right? 
So if we're going to be peacemakers, I thought it would be important for us to understand. So the biblical foundation is this. The Old Testament understanding of peace in Hebrew is the word shalom. Conveyed much more, this word conveyed uh, much more than the absence of conflict or disorder. If you have peace, it's much more than everything being cool. In fact, the peace, rather, had a positive connotation, and it, it's this. To live in peace was to live in right relations with God, oneself, and one's neighbor, and indeed the whole creation. Do you remember what God told Adam and Eve at the, in the creation story? They were, to, they were to shepherd. They were to take care of the creation of God. That was a big part of their job, right? God God made it all. He's like, now take care of it. Amen? Unlike your son and your daughter who said, if you'll give me a puppy, I promise you will never clean up the yard after that, right? And you're out there going, they're lying, they're lying, they got to get to church. Right? That's Right, Jeff? Yes, sir? I know, all of us. Okay, that's right. So, so it, it's living at peace for on, on the first level, okay, with God, in relationship with God, with oneself, then with our neighbors, and then with this whole creation. Righteousness, therefore, was constitutive of peace. Real righteousness, to be right and have righteousness in your life, is to be in right relationship and to be living your life in a position of peace. Isn't that great? I'm cool with God. He's cool with me because of Jesus. That's the reality. I'm good with myself because of what God has done in me. And I'm at peace within myself. And then that spills out to, I am at peace with you, and I am at peace with my neighbors based upon what God has done within me, what I believe he's done in me. And because I am living at this place of peace and I live in stewardship of a covenant with God, then I'm going to help take care of the creation as best as I can. Right? I'm going to be good, too. Yeah, okay? So... So righteousness, therefore, is constitutive of peace. So many times we think of righteousness, and it, we can be tempted this way, to think of righteousness as living your life with the absence of sin only. So I know a lot of people that are squeaky clean in a lot of uh, social areas of their life, but they are as mean as a snake. I just thought I would say it because I know you're thinking it. They're not at peace with themselves, and they're certainly not at peace with their neighbors, and Although they may be an activist about creation, who knows? But that's not righteousness. So if we're really going to be a peacemaker, we have to live our life at the place then of peace on all of these levels. So how do we do this? We live within the covenant communion with God. His promises. With God, God provides the best image of what peace would mean if it was a state of overall well-being. I am, it is well with my soul. When it's well with my soul and I'm, I'm good with God and I'm good with what he's doing in me and I'm good with you and, you know, my family and as much as I can be, right? And then I cut my grass and feed my birds. You all should come to my house at least one time this year. I have a zoo in my backyard. My goodness. Uh, don't I? I have a zoo. I mean, if it walks, crawls, or flies, it's at my house. I go as, we have, we have birds as big as the herons in our house and as small as hummingbirds and everybody in between. And I saw this red bird that I had never seen before. And it is an Indiana bird, but I'll let I'll you be a missionary. No, it's not a robin. I know what you're thinking. No, it's not a cardinal. Although I have one nesting outside of my kitchen. So when I walk by, I'm like, easy, mama, easy. She's got little four little speck legs and like, be cool, I'm, I'm coming by, I'm a, I'm a friend, all right? And then we have rabbits, oh my gosh. I love to eat rabbits. So if I see you disappear in my bar, oh, so does Huck, <laughs> yeah. Huck loves rabbits. And then we got deer and we go, oh my, it's just, so I'm like, okay, God, I'm gonna take, we're going to take care of this. So I'll feed them and I'll do those kinds of things. Why? Because God created them kind of a deal. And then for patience in my life, God gave me Gracie. <laughs> She's the Yorkshire Terrier that will never die <laughs> and not stop defiling my floors. So anyway, pray for me. 
It needs to be well in my soul. So let's just take a look at three areas this morning. We'll have time for two, but we won't have time for the third, and we'll pick it up next week, all right? <clears throat> oh, my goodness, I forgot to start my timer. <laughs> just kidding. Because I know when Angie said 30 minutes, you're like, mm -hmm, right, that is not true. I'm watching, all right? So let's talk about, let's talk about right relationship with God. And the Magna Carta verse of that for us is found in Romans chapter 5. This is such a magnificent chunk of scriptures. I'm just going to read along, okay? And I believe it, I'm starting at verse 1. Therefore, since, here it is. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into the place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. We and confidently and joyfully look forward to the sharing of God's glory. What a concept. But that is what has happened. That's an established promise. There's nothing that you need to do in your life to attain to that unless you haven't given your life to Christ. If you haven't given your life to Christ to be your Savior and Lord, this morning would be a great time for that. This would be, today would be a wonder. In fact, the scripture says, if you hear the good news today, if you hear the gospel today, do not put off responding to it. Because this is what he's done. We look forward to the sharing of, of God's glory. We can rejoice too that when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help uh, us develop deep endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Verse 5 And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how, this is so awesome, for we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So when we utterly, uh, when we were utterly helpless, verse 6, Christ came at just the right time and died for sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. And someone might perhaps be willing to give their life or die for a person who's especially good, but God showed his great love for us, sending Christ to die, die while we were still yet sinners. I mean, we wouldn't even have made the map of qualifying for somebody to give their life. They're like, no, they're just, they're so, just let them go. They're, they are not worth it. But the Son of God came for a planet of people from the world's es estimation who were not worth it. Why? because you are to him. Is that not marvelous? He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. All right, you won't do it by your behavior, you won't do it by your goodness, you won't do it by your, by your sheer wit and skill, no. He has done that. So he's taken the burden off of your life in all of those areas for you to be able to be something, okay? For since, our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son. While we were still enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of the son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. Man, that is so much better than just being my friend. Friends with God. Jesus Christ has taken the burden of everything that separated us from God, which was sin, remember? The reason why we have conflict in this world is because of sin. And Jesus Christ absorbed all of that. He didn't have to. He didn't commit any of it. It wasn't his to do at all. But he decided that he was going to be the first peacemaker and before the, the foundations of the world were laid, Jesus agreed that he would do that. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. So I think it's pretty safe to say that we can be in this room comfortable with Jesus Christ's performance. Amen? Did he not perform well for you? And you never have to worry about anything. What shall separate us from the love of God? 
And then he lays out a whole list of everything that the world worries about. So while the world can be at a state of agitation, consternation, in other words, the people of God can be at peace. Unbelievable peace. Peace without explanation. Why are you not upset by this? I don't know. I'm just not. Well, part of it is because I've decided not to pick that up and carry it. I've decided to not listen about it for hours. I've decided to not, you know, allow that to invade my mind. I, I have a friend of mine who's, uh, he's a real friend. I'm just not an imaginary friend, but he's a real friend. All right, just want you to know. He's president of North Central University. And uh, there was just a moment in time where he was having a bit of conflict with some folk in his church, which never happened here. Thank you, Lord. That I know of. You don't tell me. I appreciate that. Okay. But he said to the Lord one day as he was pouring coffee in his kitchen, I am just not going to let them take my peace. I'm not going to allow my peace to be robbed by the situation. I'm not going to allow my peace to be robbed by their opinion. I'm just not going to do that. Lord, you've given it to me. It's my inheritance. It's all mine. And I'm going to hold on to that because God gives that to you as a child of God. That is your inheritance. That when everything is shaking and the, and the mountains fall into the sea, man, you have peace. The moment you're going to breathe out your last breath, you don't have to worry. You have peace. And no one can actually qualify how that moment's going to happen. I don't know how I'm going to go to heaven. Got no idea what's going to be my transport. If Jesus doesn't return at my time, that I get to see it, okay, that's a preferred way to go. Amen. Wouldn't it be great before I get done speaking? All of a sudden, boom, we're there. Hey. Yeah, that means I didn't, you're not paying your tax bill this year. I mean, hey, it's just lots of good stuff. He interrupts, but there are times where, where this, this body is just going to run out of juice. That's why I'm so big. I'm packing it in just so I go long haul. If there's a famine, I'm going to outlive some of you for sure <laughs> by weeks, right? I think it's genetics. That's what I think. But then comes the next part. We can have, now most of us can have some pretty good confidence in the work of God and say, yes, I really do believe he's my friend and that he's my father and that he loves me and that he superintends my life. And there, there's going to be times where it's tough, trials, hard, hard things are going to happen. That's part of living. That's part of living in a fallen planet. We, we, shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be surprised by that. That's just part of it. What gets tough is when we create our chaos, but I talked about that last week, so I'll keep going. But number two, number two, now this is what's really important, and we're going to kind of stay here today, and then we're going to worship the Lord in response to this. And that's this, right relationship with yourself. This is more difficult than the first one, because the first person has complete perfection, <laughs> you know, he is, oh, he does all things well. He's not late. Even in the midst of deep disappointment, he manifests his presence, and you can sense him and know him to know God. Oh, it's magnificent, but it gets really difficult when we don't have a right relationship with ourselves. Before we can live as, as a peacemaker, we must be at peace with ourselves if we are able to protect, I mean, project peace to others. Now, we've all heard the We've all heard the phrase, fake it till you make it. And that does work. I mean, people know that's not very authentic. No, actually, if you don't feel like being nice, can you fake it? If, if you don't feel like being kind, can you fake that? Just be kind. If you're nasty and you just, you just, you're just grouchy and, you know, you didn't have a sweet T-shirt like this in your drawer like I had today, you know, and yours is a little snug and your buttons are beginning to, just, okay, just, all right, I understand. I, I got that too. Can we just fake that? Right? Can we have some discipline and, and say, no, real authenticity is I'm going to live at the level of my feelings. Well, that takes us to the very next place. The whole world lives at that level. Just make one driving mistake in South Bay. And you'll have lots of people tell you about yourself. Right? But what's important is we have to be at peace with our, if, because peace 
peacemaking isn't what we do, it's who we are. It's actually in the Beatitudes, if you go all the way to the bottom, it's the next to the last. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, or children of God, depending upon your translation. Oh, man, wait, wait, wait. I have, this is what I'm supposed to be? Yeah, yeah. That's what makes this really difficult, because uh, everything in us, in our nature, outside of Christ, our old nature, part of us, everything in us wants to be satisfied. It wants us, it you know, you know, oh man, you just, you just want to be pleased, you want to be pampered, you want to be comforted. I mean, how good is it when you finally lay down in bed at night and there's not anything else to do, right? Or you're like me and you're good at procrastinating and there's nothing else you're going to do. You lay down, you're like, oh, thank you. Oh, this is so good, right? Oh, it's so good. And then the cuckoo clock goes off in my house. And my wingman has a busted limb. And I got to get up and shut the clock off. Mm -hmm. Little thing, right? Little thing, but you don't want to do it. Do you have a list of things that you don't want to do? Right? I don't want to do that. I don't want to. Right? Yeah. yeah. We, we all have it. So we're all good. We're all at the room. We're all going to talk about that today. So, so number one, if we're going to be at peace with ourselves. It begins with believing, believing what God says about me. If you're going to be at peace with yourself, don't believe what the world says about you. Don't believe what you think about yourself, independent or without the influence of God's word, okay? But believe what God says about you. And some of you are like, well, Pastor, I, I'm really not sure what God does say about me. Good, you're in the right place because we meet twice a week to tell you what God says about you. For some of you, you're going to be shocked, but we have church here on Wednesday night where we learn. For seven years. When I started, they're like, oh, you're going to do adult things? Nobody ever does adult things here. Oh, it's good for three weeks, but then nobody comes. And I said, well, I guess I'll be here by myself. But then our women's ministry fired up, and they've been leading the way the whole time. Thank you, ladies. By the way, did you see what I posted on our Facebook recently? Oh, go check Southgate Facebook. Mm. It's really good. Okay. But it's really important that we learn about us and learn about what he says. Why? Because it does two things. It helps us deal with false desires and false fears. False desires and false fears. Romans chapter 13, no, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 32. This is the other large chunk, and then we're going to be done here pretty quick. You ready? This is what the Apostle Paul says to the church of Ephesus, which was a large city of commerce at that time. It would be, mm, if you could put Las Vegas on a seaport, that was Ephesus. Got the picture? Okay? So that was Ephesus. And this is where he built a great church. And so, so understand, these are the people that are living there, okay? And don't be mistaken. Don't make the same mistake that it's common. You think that everybody in Las Vegas lives like everything that's going on in Las Vegas. No, that's just where the states decide to make their money. And there's lots of people that will fly in and gladly give their money away. But it's filled with wonderful, godly people, just like Ephesus was here. So, so this is what he says to them in Ephesians chapter 4, 17 to 32. He says, so I... So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk. That's somebody who's not a believer, okay? Non-Jewish, non-believer. Just as they walk. How do they walk? How does this world live? Because walk is synonymous to live. Don't live like them. How do they live? In the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is within them because of the hardness of their hearts and they having become callous has given themselves over to sensuality and the practice of every kind of impurity and greediness that's how the world lives now you can see how you that's fraught with danger and problems because nobody can please you like you, and you can't even please yourself as many times as you want to be pleased. That's how the world works. But you did not listen, and I love how he says this, but you didn't learn Christ in this way if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him. 
See, some people will fake the relationship. They'll fake the spiritual thing. They'll take the tag. They love the music. They like the fellowship. They like to be around spiritual people, but they haven't gone into the deep work of really finding out who he is and being willing to grow and say no to the things they should be saying no to in their life because if they don't say no to them, you just read the list, the hardness of my heart actually has a correlation to what my mind can understand. And my heart gets callous because of the behavior. So if my hand is doing the wrong stuff, it's because my heart wants it to, and it corrupts what I think. That's the picture. So what we do as believers is, is we deal with those three areas of our life, and we put on something different, and it's in our text, and so I'll read that. But you did not learn Christ this way, if indeed you have heard of him and be taught in him, be just as truth is in Jesus, and that's the part that you're going to have to believe is for you. Is truth really in Jesus? Is that really true? If it is true, then he has authority over our lives. If you don't think it's true, then you have authority over your life. All right? So, you, oh, here you go. Let me back up. You've been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference, here it is, to your former manner of life, so everybody in this room that's given their life to Christ used to live the other way. Amen? I know you were little and it's hard for you to remember, but for some of you, you're like, oh, yeah, amen. You lay aside, here we go. What do we do now? You lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts and the deceits, deceits that have, uh, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay, that's, that's important. You lay aside the old self, and you allow God to renew how you think. How does that happen? Through the process of his presence and his word coming together. It's spirit-fired discipleship. It's not just the word alone. You can't have it. You need to have his presence because you can't understand the, pre the word without the presence. This is not a book that you read like any other book. This is a living book, and it has to be translated through the Holy Spirit that is with inside of you so that you can know what to do. So it's knowledge on fire. The problem is, is we get stuck with just reading the knowledge. When we don't come to him and let him set us on fire. And we got to have the spirit of God to light us up so we can understand his word. Amen? But we'll never come to him if our life is corrupted and we're just doing what we want to do. That is the problem in Ephesus. And, and Paul's trying to help them to do this. So he says, listen, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust and deceits, that you may be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness, state of well-being, righteousness, and holiness and truth. Therefore, here we go, and this is really, oh, man, if you can highlight on your device, do it. I, have, I shall never put my sermon in 10 font again. Here we go. I'm going to read this slowly so we get it. Therefore, worship team, you can come back. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth to each one. And do not sin. Yeah, do not sin. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the truth, and I'm going to make you hurt because I tell you. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you the truth because I love you. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. That's because if unprocessed anger becomes all kinds of things, nonproductive. He who... He who steals must not steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with someone who has need. So what's the goal of work? Generosity. It's not just building my big, bad nest egg. I don't know about you, but I'm not looking at my 301B retirement account this week. I didn't look at it in 2008 either. 
I'm not sure what's going to be there when I get there. Right? But that's not why I work. I mean, I try, but we do those things, maybe, but ultimately my, my source is God. Amen? So that I can be generous. Why do I work? I, I work so that I can be generous, so that I can, I can give, I can help, I can share. So that you'll have something to share with someone in need. Let no one, now here it is. This is so important. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. But only such a word as is good for the edification according to the need of the moment. So that it will give grace to those who hear. What does that mean? I mean, on the surface, okay. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for the edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. There's a mouth-heart connection that Jesus talks about. If there's good stuff in here, there's going to be good stuff here. But if you're pumping junk out of here, don't tell me this is good. If you have a language problem, you have a cardiac problem. Your life will change dramatically when you add Christian discipline to your speech. And you begin to create a reality around you where people like to be around you. Because they'll begin to say stuff like, wow, Lauren, I just like to be around you because I feel good. You make me feel good. Because what I say in your presence builds life to you. We are going, we're starting an unfortunate four-year slog of political season. You think I was just talking about cussing. Right? Right? But we're going through a very unfortunate four-year period of time. Midterm elections, national elections. So as the body of Christ, we are not going to fuel the war. But we are called to fuel peace. And when that begins to gin up around you, the scripture says God can give you by his spirit a word that is so profound that it's like an apple of solid gold in a setting of silver. In fact, he says that a quiet, gentle word can turn away wrath. Peacemaker. Because I live my life. Man, I want to go through four years of peace with Jesus. And I want to help people not be afraid. But this world is doing everything it can to condition us to be afraid. But I know the Prince of Peace. And if I know him and if I'm like him, I'm going to be a peacemaker. And what's vital is the only thing I can know about you and me is what you say. I can't read your heart. I don't know your spirit. I can't divine your motive. God does all of those things. And he says to the Ephesians that we're such a sinful, horrible, licentious, dirty. I mean, it's a bad place. You wouldn't want to live there. Watch what you say. Oh, it has a whole lot to do with marital relationships. Has a whole lot to do with what you say to your kids, what they hear you say. I thought I'd write a book called The Laundromat Chronicles. I've been going to the last couple of weeks, and I don't know. It's, I think the laundromat's like the confession booth. Because I hear people on their phones talking. I heard one guy say to his, I don't know if they're married or not, but his significant other, well, yeah, I'll push you if I want to. I'm like, uh oh. Jeff could go to jail today because you better not push her here because I will lay on you as I call the police and you won't get up, I promise. You know, so I just got that. It's like, oh no, Lord, ah, I got no. So anyway, that's the world we live in. What I can 
I can speak. So as this conflict is going, this little, beautiful little girl comes running around the corner. And I go, hi, honey. Hi. What you doing? Running. Do you want somebody to chase you? Uh-huh. Ain't going to be me. <laughs> Unless this building's on fire, I ain't running. I said, do you want your mommy to chase you? Uh-huh. Hey, mom. Do you want to chase her? She goes, snapped out of that. Yes. And they, that's it. Just bring some peace in their life. Be engaged with your surroundings. And let's bring peace in their life. Amen. Amen. That's a good place to say that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, I'll lay it out. Let all bitterness, let all wrath, let all anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with malice. Along with malice. Here it is, you ready? Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ forgave you. <laughs> Romans 13 11, do this. Knowing the time is already the hour for, your, for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness. And what do we do? We put on the armor of light. So get dressed a little differently in the morning. Amen. And just know who you are. Know what God says about you. And finally, I would... This is included in your notes. Thank you, Lauren. So I want to give you, I want to leave you something practical before we worship. And it's it's a it's a prayer for deliverance from false desires and fears. I really want to encourage you. If you struggle with anything that's on this, let's pray this. So many Christians around the world pray this prayer. So let's just pray it with them and take it with you and just put it on a card wherever you see it. But it's really simple. Because it, it's a work of the Spirit of God to change you the, into being a peace. It's not a psychological trick. It's not some sort of uber discipline. It's a work of God in you. You've got to ask him to transform you. So Jesus will deliver you from your insecurity. So I'm going to read this, and then the worship team is going to begin. You ready? This is the prayer. Deliver me. Deliver me. I can't do it myself, Jesus. Deliver me, oh Jesus, from the desire to be esteemed, from the desire to be loved, from the desire to be honored, from the desire to be praised, from the desire to be preferred to others, from the desire to be consulted, from the desire to be approved, from the desire to be popular. Why can I let all that go? Because unbelievably with God, I am esteemed, I am loved, I am honored, I am already praised, I have been preferred. He does consult with me. God Almighty, ask me a question, all right? Not for him to be educated, it's more about my own ignorance at times. He has approved me in Jesus. And I am popular because he sings over me when I sleep. And he does that for you. So that, that's a, the, the desire. But deliver me, O oh Lord. Here's the fear. And fear is so powerful that it prevents you. It prevents you from doing the things that you want to do and, and to be. You get frozen by that. So deliver me, O oh Jesus, from the fear of being humiliated from the fear of being despised, from the fear of being rebuked, from the fear of being slandered, from the fear of being forgotten, from the fear of being wronged, from the fear of being un treated unfairly, and from the fear of being suspected. I am so afraid of all those things, I will do nothing. No, you won't be a peacemaker. You have to take the risk. Jesus already told you, love me. They won't like you. That's okay. I love you. 
because I have what Jesus has. And then finish it up with, and dear Jesus, grant me the grace to desire others, that others might be more loved than I, that others might be more esteemed than I, that in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I decrease, that others may be chosen and I may be set aside, that others may be preferred to me in everything, and that others may be holier than I, caveat, provided that I too become as holy Jesus said, love your neighbor like you love yourself. Amen? So, Father, we come to you this morning, and the best news is that we can be all of those things. We can be peacemakers. We are children of God. And because by your blood you have reconciled all things, whether in the heavens or in the earth, the scripture says, you have made peace by your blood. Therefore, we can do that. So this morning, as your children, we stand in your presence and we ask you, God, to move by your power. And we respond to you today. Speak to us by your spirit. In Jesus' name. As we go into worship this morning, we're going to sing a new song. And I just really feel this morning in my spirit, if you are going through turmoil in your house, with your families, uh, things going on at work, if you need to take care of any of the things that Pastor Jeff had uh, just talked about, about being a peacemaker, things we need to correct, um, I would invite you to come up to the front We just want to sing this song over you this morning. just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to flee Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Sing your name. 
Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like the fire. Shout Jesus from the mount. Jesus in the streets, Jesus over darkness, over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountain, Jesus
when I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how He picked me up and turn me around how he placed my feet on solid ground it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the that you have corrected even when it was on our own doing Lord God 
thank you that you do give us that grace and you cover us daily from things, Lord Jesus, that we don't even know are about to take place in our lives, Lord Jesus. Thank you for preparing us, Father God, as we build this relationship with you, Lord God. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your healing power, Father God, over April Howell this morning, Father God. We thank you, Father God, when things looked tough, when things looked hard, you raised her from that bed, Father God. You healed her body, Father God. And right now, I pray over her hearing, Lord Jesus. I pray over her eyesight right now, Father God, that they would line up like they should, Father God. We speak this over her right now, Lord Jesus as she is in her recovering time, Lord God. Lord Jesus, help this to be a testimony, Father God, that she, when she goes back to work, Father God, this will be her testimony, Lord Jesus, of your goodness. Lord Jesus, thank you. Lord God, right now, I just pray you walk with us as we answer your call to be peacemakers, Lord God. Increase our compassion, our generosity, our hospitality, Father God, for the least of your children, Father. And that the gentleness of spirit that are needed in the world and filled with turmoil and terror, Father God. Therefore, Father, give me your patience, your peacemaking, take, even when it must take longer, Father God. And it gets messier, Lord Jesus, than I would want it to, Lord God. Give me your courage when you send people in situations into my uh, way, Father God, that I want to so much avoid. Help us to practice the fruits of the Spirit, Father God, which are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, Lord God. When going into our homes, our workplace, and our church, Father God, help us to share your joy and your glory, Lord God. Lord, throughout this week, I just pray you help us make a difference in our surroundings and the places you have placed us in, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, as we go through this day. Lord Jesus, help us wherever you may send us, Father God. Be peacemakers, and it's because of you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Now, may the peace of the Lord go with us and go with you wherever you, he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through that storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. And may he bring you home rejoicing once again. Thank you so much for being with us today online and in person. Um, we love you guys and we will see you next week. Have an awesome day.